Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage conference co-chairs, Dr. Michael Grant and Dr. Debbie Kelly. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Michael and I are very pleased to welcome you all to St. John's for the 23rd Annual CAR Conference. We're particularly excited to host this year's conference as it's the first time it's ever been held in Newfoundland. We ordered up the sunshine today just for you, so please enjoy it. We hope you'll enjoy the hospitality and the city as well as the full conference program that we have planned for you. At this time, I would like to welcome Elder Emma Relis to the stage to open our conference with an Inuit prayer and welcome. Emma Relis is an Inuit woman from Labrador and she is the current president of the Board of Directors at the St. John's Native Friendship Center. Thank you. And welcome everybody and uh, thank you for inviting me here to do the opening prayer. Lord God, our creator, we gather here today at the 23rd Annual Canadian Conference on HIV and AIDS Research to ask for your guidance over the next few days that will allow all to work together to create a positive life for those people that are living with HIV and AIDS. I wish hope for all in attendance that they continue to work together to find healing and hope for those people that are living and affected by this deadly disease, to heal them from their bodily pain and inflictions. Guide their every step and give them the courage to walk the circle of life with honesty and dignity. As people of faith, we are called to create an environment of hope, compassion, and care for people living with sickness. Creator, I pray that you protect all who are on their journeys of life, and to thank you for, for help and the positive guidance, courage, wisdom, and respect that you give and show us every day. So thank and praise God every day so you can continue the task that you were all, continue the work that you were all tasked to do. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Elder Realis, for gracing us with that prayer and welcome. We felt that the maritime theme, Turning the Tide, would be appropriate for this conference for, for a number of reasons, not just because we're at the far east coast of, of Canada. We truly believe that we're on the, the cusp of a new era in HIV research and that the, post, the program that's been put together uh, for this weekend really reflects that reality of, the, of the, at least the cusp of the new era that we're at for uh, HIV research. The scientific program committee, as always, has done an outstanding job selecting the plenary speakers, sorting the submitted abstracts into oral and poster sessions, choosing the scholarship awardees, and developing some special sessions that address global, national, and local issues. So I'd like to congratulate all the, the many worthy community and academic scholarship recipients this year, and at the same time thank some of our partners who helped make uh, the additional scholarships possible. I'd like to thank the co-chairs in, in all four tracks and the community chair for doing such a, a great job uh, essentially assuring that I remain a little more than a figurehead in my role as co-chair of, of the conference. So I'd also like to thank the organizations that held ancillary meetings or holding ancillary meetings either before or after the conference. It's a long way to travel for many people and the extra motivation of the ancillary sessions, uh, bringing more people here is great and encouraging them to come early or, or stay late and spend some more time in St. John's. Especially I'd like to thank all of you for, for coming to the conference and sharing your ideas, your information with your, with your colleagues over the weekend. The academic agenda for the conference is pretty much set, but the the entertainment agenda, like the weather, is, is uh, more uncertain and a little fluid, and we hope that you'll take advantage of, of some of the local sites uh, so to have a good time outside of the conference as well as, as at the conference. It's a uh, short distance to 
George Street, where 90% of the entertainment in St. John's is, is concentrated, carry on a little bit further up past George Street to Signal Hill, and you can have a, a walk along the rugged eastern coastline and experience a bit of the outdoors of, of Newfoundland, all within walking distance of the, of the hotel. So if you didn't get a chance to get out today when it was nice and sunny, please take the opportunity at some point in the weekend to get out and experience a little bit of, of St. John's, at least in the, in the downtown area. I know for, for many of you, this will be the, the, the first time here, and uh, you see some, if you go to Signal Hill, you'll see some great natural sites. If you go to George Street on Friday night, you might see some very interesting and somewhat unnatural sites as well. <laughs> so with that, uh, I'll call upon co my co-chair, Dr. Debbie Kelly, to introduce our first speaker. The CAR Conference unites us all, scientists and researchers, clinicians, clinicians and advocates, people living with and affected by HIV, as we all work diligently toward our goal for a world without HIV and AIDS. Our next guest has been similarly touched by HIV and has been a vocal advocate, raising awareness of HIV using his creative medium. Greg Malone is a native Newfoundlander, and he's probably best known for the CODCO and wonderful Grand Band television series, as well as his wicked impersonations of political icons like George Bush, the Queen, and Barbara Frum, for which he's won many awards, including over a dozen Gemini Awards. Besides being an award-winning actor, writer, and director, he's a best-selling author, political activist, and was the recipient of an honorary Doctorate of Letters degree from Memorial University in recognition of his artistic and cultural contributions. Notably, Greg wrote, directed, and performed the award-winning Sex, Drugs, and HIV to raise awareness of the impediment preju prejudice is to the health care of people with H living with HIV. He continues to hold a number of acting credits, including the role of Finn in the popular television drama Republic of Doyle. We're delighted to have Greg join us this evening to bring greetings and to welcome you all to the conference. Please join me in welcoming Greg Malone. Well, thank you very much. That was very lovely. Um, and welcome, everyone, to Newfoundland. I hope you're all feeling at home. I know you've come a long way to get here, from Victoria all the way to Halifax. And you know, a lot of people get as far as Nova Scotia, and then they give up. They never get to the promised land. But you got here. Congratulations. I've, I myself have spent, actually, a lot of time in Nova Scotia. And Nova Scotia is a lot like Newfoundland. Um, Newfoundland is a lot more rugged, of course, but if you took Newfoundland, sanded her down, put a coat of varnish on her, you'd have Nova Scotia. <laughs> I remember when I first left the Isle of Newfoundland and went to the mainland, the most, the thing that blew my mind, really, as a young man, when I got to the valley there in Nova Scotia, is that they had actual earth, real soil, and you could dig a hole in the ground with a shovel. Not dynamite and plant a tree or bury your dead. It's fantastic, you know. Here, if someone dies, you lift a rock, you throw them in, you put the rock down, that's it, they're done. And that expression, you know, between a rock and a hard place, I could never understand that expression because, you know, that's where I live. There's the rock, there's the hard place, there's my street, goes right up the middle. Just to crawl in over a snow drift to your second story window and you're home, that's it. And when people ask me, you know, what rock did you crawl out from under, I thought, I didn't know it was an insult. I thought they were asking for my address. <laughs> the answer being Rocky Harbor, Flat Rock, you know, one of those other rocky locations. But anyway, the important thing is that you made it here and that you made it here safely. I have to say that because everything is security these days. We're obsessed with security, I know. Uh, and in fact... I, I don't like flying at all anymore, really, because, I mean, it's, it's, it's just no fun anymore. Remember, you remember years ago when you'd have, uh, you know, the stewardess and the steward would bring you exquisite little mini meals and little mini dishes with little mini drinks? God, it was mini marvelous, mate. Nowadays, you're lucky if they fling a bag of pretzels at you as they rush by. I got pretzels the other day on the board. Pretzels. Pretzels are not a standalone food. They're an accessory to beer. And they shouldn't be given to children because they'll just encourage them to, you know, drink Bud Light and that sort of thing. Right. No. No, everything is gone on uh, the airlines today. You're lucky if you get your seat. And it's all because of the security 
procedures that have, they've put in place. They're very expensive, so everything has to be cut back. We've, we've lost salads and Beaujolais and circulation to our legs, but I suppose it's all for the better. I know I feel a whole lot safer in the security lineup out at the airport here when I see them giving some poor old woman from Cape Breton the shakedown, you know? <laughs> Lose the Dr. Scholl's lady. <laughs> she goes for it. What were they doing? They, she, she had me convinced. I thought she was the real thing. But of course, Al-Qaeda has gotten brilliant at disguises, and it was the hot flight from St. John's to Moncton. <laughs> No, it's too much, really. I think they, we would have no trouble with security at the airports if the people who are in charge of protecting that toilet paper were in charge of protecting the people. Have you seen where they keep the toilet paper out there? The bulletproof plexiglass dome that it's in, you know? And the explosive-resistant metal and polymer alloy box there with the lock on it? What, what, what's, what's, it's not gold inside, it's toilet paper. You're not getting it. No, the message is clear. No terrorist is going to wipe his arse in this country. <laughs> but neither are you, of course. And let's face it, you're in a very ticklish position. There you are, with your pants down around your ankles in a cubicle in the middle of a busy international airport. I mean, it's like being naked in front of the world. Or, you know, it feels like being in the principal's office with your pants down or something. <laughs> Anyone who's had a good Catholic education. <laughs> I'm talking about a good one now. Well, anyway, there you are in the middle of a big international airport with your pants down. All you want to do is a bit of toilet paper to get on with your life. Now, if you're lucky, if you're very lucky, you'll see a square or two of toilet paper hanging down out of the dome, right? Well, don't just yank that and think you're going somewhere because you'll only get the one square and you're not going to do anything with that, right? <laughs> Remember, these dispensers do not want to give up any toilet paper. So just take a deep breath and calm right down. And with your thumb and your forefinger, take one side of that square of toilet paper, and with the other thumb and forefinger, take the other side of that square of toilet paper, okay? Distribute the weight evenly, or you will be sorry. And then very, very slowly, just like you're not even pulling at all, just start to slowly tug down out of there. And if you feel any separation at all, any separation anxiety whatsoever, move up to the next square and start again. And move up and start like that, until eventually, Eventually, you think you have enough toilet paper. Well, don't just tear it off and go on because you'll never get back for seconds, right? No. What you need to do is move two or three squares down from the tissue event horizon, hold the toilet paper and tear it off there, leaving yourself three or four squares or chads or tabs to go back and work with. And there you are. But of course, sometimes you get in there and there's nothing. There's no sign of toilet paper anywhere. Nothing hanging out of the dome, nothing hanging out of the box. What do you do then? Well, it's, it's all very awkward, I know, but you have to, really, what are you going to do? You have to bend over and reach under and up into the box and blindly grope around for the soft tissue. Have you ever done that? I know you, I know I have. And really, it helps to be a gynecologist to do that. <laughs> or you'd have to be Doogie Howser, really, of course, because the fully added, grown adult hand can't fit up into that box. It's, it's just not dilated enough. So the best thing in the end to do is bring a small child in there to access the toilet paper for you. I know it's very embarrassing and awkward, but one of these days soon they're going to be wiping your arse in some nursing home anyway, so it's just as well to get them used to these important security procedures right away. <laughs> it's a wonderful world, isn't it? Well. We're obsessed with security. Of course, the news is full of it. I watch a lot of news, actually. I like the BBC news, stiff upper lip and all that sort of thing, you know? The BBC World Service is perhaps the coldest news service in the world. They've been reporting on atrocities disease longer than anyone else. They see no need to become emotionally involved. They see no likelihood of it letting up in the near future. Of course, here across the pond, I think we're a lot more relaxed about our news. We have Peter Mansbridge. He's the perfect anchor. And even his name, Peter Mansbridge, a rock of a man, building bridges over difficult issues for Canadians. Perfect. <laughs> and he's matched like bookends with Ian Han Hanneman singing on the West Coast. Ian Handsome Man sings the news from BC, Canada's <laughs> Songbird Province. But you know, my favorite news people of all, and we all admire them, I know, are the foreign correspondents. By God, they work for their money. 
and they're great people. They're all very much different, of course, but they all have that same special emphasis in their delivery that makes them so believable. If they read the phone book in that voice, I'd be listening. If they read the Bible in that voice, I'd believe it. Today, the inhabitants of the twin cities of Sodom and Gomorrah fled in panic as destruction rained down from above. <laughs> Refugees were advised by a higher authority not to take anything with them as they fled the scene and not to look back. <laughs> However, one refugee was overcome by her curiosity. Wife of prominent businessman Lot did look back and was immediately turned into a pillar of salt. Terry Molesky, CBC News, in the plain of Negev. <laughs> the news. We've been dealing with Sodom and Gomorrah for a long while, actually, now. I think I wrote that back in 1993. In 1993, my partner Tommy Sexton and I had just finished taping the last season of our uh, Codco TV show on CBC. And at the end of that year, Tommy died of complications from AIDS. And I guess it took me about 10 years to get over that, really. I remember all those guys who died back then. So many young people in my generation lost. It was like the war. That's all I could compare it to. That's all, that's all I could compare that feeling to, of losing so many people. It was like the war. I still think of them all the time. Of course, I still talk to Tommy in the back of my head, too. In fact, <laughs> Uh, the other day I was in front of the mirror pulling gray hairs out of my eyebrows, <laughs> again. And I uh, heard this little voice in the back of my head saying, now my son, you're gonna, ha you're gonna have to either decide you're gonna have gray eyebrows or no eyebrows, but you're gonna have to make up your mind soon. <laughs> that was Tommy. <laughs> these are the kind of gut-wrenching decisions I have to make these days in my life. Of course, Tommy will never have to make them, or the other fellas. They suffered and they died, but they did not die in vain. Remember what it was like back then? I know some people out here can remember what it was like. I was thinking of it the other day. You know, we started out with a really ugly and stigmatizing disease that landed on an already marginalized, stigmatized population. It was like the new leprosy. People were actually hunting down patient zero. Where was the guy who started all this? Let's get him. You know, that was the attitude at the time. And of course, what a shock when they found out it was an Air Canada steward. I mean, <laughs> who would have guessed with their safety record and all, but anyway. <clears throat> Every Sunday, we were condemned and vilified by TV evangelists on television across the country. You know, AIDS was God's punishment on homosexuality, so I thought to myself, well, how did the hemophiliacs get in there? Did God just get carried away with the judging? You know, you and you and you. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to include you in that list. And what about the lesbians? How did the lesbians get away with it all, the punishment, you know? Did God forget about them? Or was God a lesbian? Hmm, beautiful, short-haired, divine dyke. Could be. But no, we were, homosexuality was unnatural, and the big thing, we weren't normal. <laughs> we weren't normal. Well, of course, homosexuality is not only normal, but a necessary part of the sexual spectrum. I don't know of any sexuality without it. That's why God keeps making them, and making them, and making them, despite legislation to the contrary. <laughs> so... Well, anyway, there we were in the pit. Gay people were blamed for the gay virus. We have brought the AIDS virus onto the world. We blamed Haitians for the AIDS virus. We blamed all of Africa for AIDS. In our panic and fear, pathology had become morality. And we were marginalized by the medical community, and we were dying fast. So from that dark and fearful place 20 years ago, we have come to a celebration of gay life and gay love and gay marriage in country after country around the world. Like and a recognition that gay rights and LBGT rights are human rights. They're civil rights just like everyone else's. 
Like that is a sea change in the thinking of the human species in one generation, a quantum leap in our development. We changed the world. How did this happen? How did this happen? It happened because of love. That's how it happened. This disease brought out the raw humanity in all of us. People saw not just the gay cliche, you know, the foo-foo, cha-cha palace, the one night stand, the Mardi Gras. Nothing's anything wrong with that. What they saw beyond that was a tremendous and unabashed outpouring of love and loyalty and dedication and willpower. The gay community refused to accept marginalization or rejection. we just come through Stonewall. For the first time in human history, the gay community had come out of the closet as a community and they weren't going back. So the gay community got their act together and they challenged the medical community. And the medical community responded to that challenge. And slowly, very slowly at first, then faster, the great super tanker that is national health care began to turn. And it all started in the consulting rooms, the clinics, the labs, and the hospitals across this country. I was there. I saw it from St. Clair's to Sunnybrook to St. Paul's. The way we practiced medicine changed. The way we thought and the way we felt changed. We went from ignorance and fear to understanding and love and victory over this disease. Not a complete victory, but a substantial victory over this disease. Together, we changed the world. Those guys did not suffer and die in vain. They were our inspiration, and together we changed the world. You have all been part of a tremendous victory, you know, and a part of history. We actually made this world a more enlightened and loving place. Congratulations. I love you all for what you've done and for what you do. And I wish you a wonderful conference and all power to your Petri dishes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Greg, for that meaningful and entertaining pr presentation. Uh, now I have the pleasure of introducing CAR Council President, Dr. Bob Hogg. Uh, in addition to being the current president of CAR, Bob is a professor in the Faculty of Health Sciences at Simon Fraser University and is director of the Epidemiology and Population Health Program at the BC Center for Excellence in HIV and AIDS. Uh, Bob is a demographer whose research focuses on the health status of persons living with HIV AIDS as well as on current treatment and management practices. Bob. Uh, before I get started, I just want to say Greg is a very hard act to follow, and I just, uh, <laughs> uh, so I apologize uh, for, but anyhow, it's uh, nice to see you all, and I just want to thank uh, Debbie and Michael for organizing uh, this conference. Uh, without their hard work, nothing would have happened, so I really appreciate it. So just let's take a second and just thank them. And then also we have to thank uh, the CAR Organizing Committee this year. Uh, they're listed here. Um, I'm listed, but I did nothing, so let's ignore me. But there's Jonathan Angel, Michael Grant, obviously, Curtis Cooper. Oh, these are the members of the council. I still did nothing, but that's okay. <laughs> um, Curtis Cooper, Carol Strike, uh, Dr. Matthias Gote, Sharik Hatter, Marisa Becker, Sarah, Sarah Green. Uh, Terry Howard and Andrew. Um, so uh, as president, it's a great honor to take part in the official opening of the 23rd annual conference. And I would like to take the opportunity to recognize the CAR Council as listed here for their hard work. Um, and of course, I'd like to thank the sponsors as well. And without their contribution, none of this would be possible. Uh, uh, th there's a platinum sponsor, Vive. So, um, Gilead, uh, Gold, uh, CIHR. I've obviously, you can read these, but I'm going to read them for you. Um, Bristol Myers Squibb, Gold. Um, uh, Janssen, also Gold. Uh, Merck, Gold sponsor. 
Abby V, bronze. Uh, BI, bronze. Uh, the CTN, bronze sponsor. And then supporters. Um, we have a variety of supporters this year, and uh, we're very thankful to have them. And it's nice to see the diversity of sponsors. The annual car conference is uh, the premier gathering in Canada for those working in all disciplines of HIV AIDS research, as well as policy makers, persons living with HIV, and other individuals committed to ending the pandemic here in Canada and elsewhere. Um, CAR will be a tremendous opportunity for researchers and community members from coast to coast to share the latest scientific advances in the field, learning from one another's expertise and to develop new ways to treat and prevent HIV AIDS. I hope you enjoy the conference and find it be, to be worthwhile a learning experience and thank you in advance for your contributions and participation and support. And now, uh, before we introduce this year's uh, keynote uh, speaker, I have the pleasure to introduce the person whom this prestigious honor is named after, Dr. Uh, Mark Weinberg. I have a, before I get started, he was a little faster than I thought he would. No, no, Mark, stay here. <laughs> um, I'll just end. Um, that's cute, actually, that he came up so quickly. <laughs> the good thing is uh, you'll know that he'll be around here for a lot longer based on his, uh, his physical, physical fitness. Uh, before I get started, I'd actually um, like to start with just a little thing that happened last night with Mark. Uh, he was out and about the town, and he was asking for directions, and so he asked a group of people for directions. And lo and behold, uh, they were uh, actually uh, members of his own um, uh, there was a research assistant that works with him, plus CTN uh, CARC uh, members, so they, it was kind of interesting. They didn't know where they were going either, so <laughs> the group of them were there together. But anyhow, for those that don't know Mark, uh, he is the head of the Lady Dady's Institute of HIV AIDS Research and the director of the McGill AIDS Center. Uh, Mark is well known uh, for his identification of 3TC as an effective antiretroviral drug, along with multiple contributions in the field of HIV drug resistance. And so now, Mike, please, Mark, please come up to this podium. Thank you, Bob. You're pretty spry yourself. Uh, bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Bienvenue à tous. Ça me fait plaisir de uh, vous accueillir en français, évidemment. Je viens d'arriver d'ici de, de, de la belle ville de Montpellier, en France, où nous avons participé dans une excellente conférence. Et euh, donc, euh, je suis très content d'être parmi vous à Terre-Neuve. Donc, euh, avant de débuter, euh, je veux vous, vous dire how happy I am that um, CAR gave us out uh, condoms this year. Uh, these are very useful when you go to George Street. Um, and uh, I want to reassure everybody that in spite of the fact that we were taught many years ago, um, do not assume that everybody knows how to use this, um, I am not going to demonstrate right now the proper way of putting on a condom. Nor am I going to take any cheap shots at Mayor Rob Ford. Um, now, you know, I, I had um, a very simple history question that I posed today to Michael Grant, um, whom I met walking uh, on the streets of, of downtown uh, St. John's this morning. Um, he was you know, virtually without any clothes on, uh, just a shirt and a pair of pants. Um, and, and I was all bundled up in my Quebec uh, outfit because it was about five degrees Celsius. Um, and uh, I asked him, you know, Michael, I've always wondered, but before Newfoundland joined Canada in 1947, did people drive on the left side of the road the way they do in England, or did they drive back then the way we do today? And he said he didn't know. So I, I'm really, uh, I, since this morning, I've been trying to get the answer to this question. I wonder if there might be a 100-year-old person in this audience, someone about, of about my age, um, who might be able to respond and, and provide us with this bit of uh, history. All right. They drove on the other side. Wow, OK, that's, that's exciting. The other thing that I've noticed. <laughs> 
The other thing that I've noticed today, thank you for that. The other thing that I've, but I don't think that you're, I think you're younger than me. Um, the other thing uh, that I noticed today, uh, that you can't get a Globe and Mail newspaper in this town. Um, it, it really seems um, unfair to people from Toronto um, who, who really require, as part of their daily diet, um, you know, the Globe and Mail and, and the National Post, although I really don't understand why anybody would want the National Post, um, but these Torontonians must have this, these newspapers every day. Um, and, and, you know, before I got up here, I, I've been looking around because um, the last times that I've come up to speak about this conference, um, you know, Julio Montana has always arrived with the Premier. Um, and I, I, I was a bit wondering, hey, where's Julio? And, and then, you know, because I looked at the ocean today and I said, oh, this is BC. And then, of course, I realized, no, it's not. It's Newfoundland. Um, and, and there's no Julio here and there's no Premier. Well, anyway, uh, enough said. But um, I, I do want to um, recognize again that this is really another in the series of Mark Weinberg pre-memorial lectures. Uh, and it is a great honor uh, for me uh, to continue to be recognized in, in, in this way, and, and also because the uh, person who's giving the lecture uh, on this occasion is a truly outstanding human rights advocate uh, from Toronto, whose name is, is Richard Elliott, who will be introduced in, in just a couple of minutes. Um, now, some people have suggested um, that it might be a good idea for the Carr Council to actually uh, take out a life insurance policy on my life, um, perhaps with Carr a as the beneficiary. And, and, and Richard, I want to tell you that there is a named, you know, there are named lecture, lectureships at other conferences. For example, at, at Croy, there's, a, there's actually a lecture named after Jonathan Mann. And some people might think that, you know, giving a Jonathan Mann lecture is maybe a bit more prestigious th than giving a Mark Weinberg lecture. And that's probably true, um, but really I, I do want to emphasize that I'm really very happy to be here tonight. And, and Jonathan Mann, of course, is no longer with us. Well, you know what, I, I've started to ask myself, because of all the activity now uh, ongoing relating to the potential to cure HIV, um, you know, what will happen to CAR if we, if we cure HIV? Will CAR continue to exist? And, and of course, um, what will happen to this lecture? Um, well, and what will happen to me? Um, <laughs> all right, well, well, having said that, and, and Greg Malone uh, made reference to a couple of serious points in his talk, and I would like to do so as well. Uh, our battles are certainly not won. We live in an era where we have made enormous progress, and yet there are many countries in the world and some of them happen to be still those that are mo the most affected and afflicted by HIV, where the erosion of human rights as we speak is ongoing to the point that there are countries that have enacted policies of legislated homophobia. And I also want to echo what Greg said, we don't need to cure homosexuality we don't even need to think about going in that direction because it's completely stupid to even have those kinds of thoughts for just a moment. But you know what? There is a condition that we should try to cure, and all it takes is education, and that condition is homophobia. That's what we should be trying to cure, mesdames et messieurs. Et nous pourrons faire ça si nous, si nous travaillons ensemble pour la guérison de l'homophobie. So, I thank you again for the, uh, for the honor, um, and I will now turn the podium back to Michael Grant. Well, thank you, Mark, for educating us in, indirectly about what side of the road we drove on 50 years ago in, in Newfoundland. I'm sure you've made much greater contributions at other conferences o over the years. <laughs> so this lecture in your name has certainly become one of the highlights of the, of the conference, and I'm truly honored to have the privilege of introducing Richard Elliott as this year's Mark Weinberg lecturer. Mr. Elliott's an internationally renowned advocate and activist in the HIV and human rights field. Having worked both on the 
front lines and in numerous advisory roles throughout his career. I, I had the pleasure of, of serving with Richard on the Ministerial Advisory Council for HIV AIDS, and I witnessed firsthand his level of commitment to promoting human rights in relation to HIV and AIDS and promoting human rights in general. He's delivered legal services to low-income people living with HIV, been counsel in key HIV cases before the Canadian courts and advised the federal government, UN agencies, and the Global Commission on HIV and the law. He's a founding member of the Global Treatment Access Group and spearheaded the Civil Society Advocacy Campaign for Access to Medicines for those suffering without treatment in developing countries. As many of you know, Richard's the executive director of the Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network. This organization promotes the human rights of people living with and vulnerable to HIV AIDS in Canada and internationally through research and analysis, advocacy and litigation, public education and community mobilization. The Legal Network is Canada's leading advocacy organization working on legal and human rights issues raised by HIV and AIDS. They are committed to turning evidence-based research on HIV AIDS related issues into action that's firmly grounded in sound legal analysis and human rights principles. The title of Richard's lecture tonight clearly reflects that commitment and the topic is especially well suited to the, to the multidisciplinary audience that attends this meeting. Richard's talk is entitled Evidence Plus Principle, Science and Scientists as Critical Enablers of Human Rights and Public Health. Richard, we're looking forward to what you have to say. Thank you. So first of all, I have to say that I'm neither an actor nor a comedian. I'm a lawyer, so please don't expect me to be particularly funny. Plus, I'm going to be talking about human rights, which is often kind of a downer. But I'll try to make it interesting, nonetheless. <clears throat> so first, let me say thank you to Andrew Matejic and to the CAR conference organizers for the great honor of being selected to deliver this year's Mark Weinberg lecture and to join the distinguished group of lecturers who have delivered it over the last 13 years. The theme of my remarks today is, as you've heard, the critical importance of HIV research and hence researchers in uh, the struggle for effective HIV responses and the critical importance of researchers working together with human rights advocates to inform and shape public policy. And so it seems to be particularly fitting to be delivering this as the Mark Weinberg lecture because this is something that Mark himself values a great deal, being both a scientist and an advocate. In fact, uh, Mark reminded me uh, when we had an exchange before this evening about uh, his dual role as scientist and activist uh, at the Durban AIDS conference in 2000, a really pivotal moment in the globe's response to HIV, uh, when, of course, it was important for science to speak to denialism, given who was then the president of the host country of South Africa and his denial of the science of HIV. And it was equally important six years later when Toronto hosted the International AIDS Conference. And again, it was important for one of the lead organizers of that conference to be speaking as an advocate based in science to the government of the day that was so uh, recalcitrant when it came to uh, basing public policy on evidence. And I'm going to actually come back to that at the very end of these remarks. But let me start by giving you a little bit of an outline. Uh, it's generally considered good form, I think, to give your audience at least something of an outline of what you hope to cover. And the risk, of course, is when you're someone like me with a lot to say about many different topics, is that you promise a lot and then you don't actually deliver before the orchestra music swells and cuts you off, in which case it's a good thing I've gotten my thanks out right at the beginning. Or perhaps the end will come more abruptly, as in the Supreme Court, when they simply cut you off once the timer goes off. So with apologies in advance, should we not reach the final destination, but with the hope that at least some of the scenery along the way is interesting, let me offer up this brief roadmap of how I'd like to tackle the theme of today's talk. I have five stages of the AIDS response to lay out for you, three case studies, and then a few concluding observations. 
And I say a few because, of course, I would be hate to be pinned down to a specific number right at the outset. After all, what if a great idea should occur to me along the way? Leave yourself some wiggle room, I say. But then you might have gathered that since I'm a lawyer. And that's always a good strategy, wiggle room. So let me dive in. On May 17th, 1988, Jake Epp was burned in effigy. In a country not usually given to such public dramas, a country with a tradition of political reserve and accommodation, the attack on the Federal Minister of Health and Welfare was a turning point in the AIDS epidemic in Canada. That's a quote from an analysis written just a few years after that demonstration by David Rayside and Everett Lindquist, in which they characterized Canada's response to HIV up to the early 1990s as having moved through roughly three stages by that point. Of course, we now have 20 more years of history to characterize. <clears throat> so I would like to start with their sketch and then fill out the rest of the picture, at least as I see it, since then. The first stage began in the early 1980s, when the virus, later identified as HIV, emerged in North America with the first AIDS case reported in Canada in 1982. During this initial phase, many politicians and officials ignored the epidemic or responded very cautiously to no small degree because, as everyone in this room no doubt knows and as we've already been reminded, it was seen largely as a concern of the marginal. The second stage began in approximately the middle of 1985 when Rock Hudson's illness became public knowledge, greatly intensifying public interest and concern and when the identification of HIV and the development of blood tests for the virus raised new issues. During this period, Canadian governments began to make important, but usually ad hoc commitments to AIDS programs. As the number of AIDS cases increased, community groups grew in size and proliferated, with new militant voices broadening the range and intensity of criticism directed at government inactivity. It was that gathering community activism, including, for example, the founding in February 1988 of AIDS Action Now, that ushered in the transition to a new phase in the HIV response. That third period began in the spring of 1988, when the pressure on all levels of government to develop coherent AIDS strategies was dramatically increased by the protests of community group activists at the National AIDS Conference, including the demonstration that I've just mentioned at the beginning. And the following year, the seizing of the stage at the 1989 International AIDS Conference in Montreal by people living with HIV to declare the conference open in the name of people living with HIV and to denounce government inaction. They also issued a Montreal Manifesto, which from the very beginning framed the response to HIV as necessarily one of human rights. This third phase of the HIV response was marked by an expansion of anonymous HIV testing in various parts of the country, demands for national standards of care, and greater access to experimental treatments. And of course, such mobilization also led to the adoption of the first national AIDS strategy in 1990, almost a decade after the emergence of the epidemic in North America, and to the Creever Commission of Inquiry into the failures of the blood system that led to so many people contracting HIV and hepatitis C through the transfusion of unsafe blood products. Yet, by a decade later, by the late 1990s, as the latter phase of the first national AIDS strategy was winding down, it seemed that some of the widespread sense of urgency in AIDS activism had been lost in too many quarters including on the part of government that is obviously such a key player in mobilizing a national response. So by the time a new federal AIDS strategy, the Canadian Strategy on HIV AIDS, was launched in 1998, we had entered what I would characterize as the fourth phase, a phase that my good friend and mentor Ralph Jurgens, the founding executive director of the Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network, has characterized as governments administering the epidemic rather than fighting it. It is, of course, significant that a new federal aid strategy was adopted, and with the important commitment that it would be supported by ongoing funding, rather than sunset after a few years, as had been the case with the phases of the earlier strategy. And that's clearly a victory to be remembered. However, even as the epidemic continued to grow and became demographically and medically more complex, the government's commitment of funding remained fixed at the same level as originally set in the first strategy. 
and it would take several more years to finally win an increase after years of erosion. Of course, uh, as some of us will know well, that phased increase suddenly came to a screeching halt a few years later, but more on that in a moment. To break out of that managerial mindset of simply administering the epidemic, something that I'm not sure we've really quite achieved yet, Jurgens called for a return to activism, including on the part of non-governmental organizations who, quote, partner with governments in implementing the aid strategies that many of us fought hard to obtain. Fortunately, new groups had emerged to renew that activism, sometimes in more local arenas, with a focus on certain populations that had so often been on the margins of the AIDS movement. I think, of course, of the organizing by people who use drugs, including the formidable and tenacious VANDU, the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users. In addition, the global dimension of the pandemic had begun to attract greater attention as part of discussing what Canada's overall response should be. And I'm happy to say that at the end of that period that uh, Jurgens characterized as simply administering the epidemic, there was this renewed push for strengthening Canada's response. And that's what brings us to what I, what I submit as the fifth and current phase that we're currently in. The release in 2005 of a new pan-Canadian framework for action, leading together, was the result of extensive discussions across the country. It represented what could have and should have been a significant development in moving beyond simply administering the epidemic to actually overcoming it. It was explicitly grounded in evidence. It was explicitly guided by human rights and social justice principles. And it declared that it, quote, lays out the optimal ideal response to HIV AIDS in Canada in the third decade of the epidemic. Furthermore, it claimed that it reflects the best wisdom, experience, and practices of those currently involved in Canada's response to HIV. And indeed, the mission was rather impressive. Here it is. It was threefold. And you see what should leap out at you is an emphasis on rights, the need for effective responses, and this rather bold statement that we were going to act boldly and strategically. Well, I will date myself a little bit by the next slide. But like Fox Mulder on the X-Files, I wanted, and I still want, to believe in that mission. But it was clear from the very launch of Leading Together, which was conspicuously not published and released by the federal government, bore no logo indicating the imprimatur of the federal government or its support, and with what I've always thought was a bizarrely bureaucratic, baffle-gab kind of title, Leading Together, which at the same time professes some sort of shared responsibility, which then too often just becomes a disclaimer of any particular responsibility on any particular party. But it should have been clear that those ringing declarations of commitment to human rights, to effective responses, and to bold action were likely to run into some trouble. Indeed, I have to say, I was a little pleasantly surprised at some of the things that were actually made it their way into the final version of Leading Together. So I'm not entirely surprised that they all didn't find a lot of purchase right away. So <clears throat> I submit that we're now in a fifth phase of the epidemic in which the government is not simply sitting back and administering the epidemic, but in fact is actively impeding efforts to fight it, and in some cases is exacerbating it. If I may push the metaphor further, the government is not simply fiddling while Rome burns, it is in fact to some degree fueling the flames. And I'll come back to this in a moment with a few illustrative examples. But first, Let's consider possibly a more, positive, uh, a more positive alternative trajectory. Let's imagine what it might take to reach the end of AIDS. Since the last International AIDS Conference in Washington two years ago, we've been hearing this phrase, the end of AIDS, quite a bit. And the notion is echoed in the theme of this year's car conference, turning the tide. After all, we need to turn the tide before we can hope to end the pandemic. Now, I must confess to some discomfort with the phrase, the end of AIDS, obviously not with the aspiration that it expresses, but rather with what it might easily be misunderstood to suggest, namely that the end of the epidemic is indeed at hand, that the back of it has largely been broken, that we've turned a corner, that there's just a little bit of mopping up left to do. Because for those, including government decision makers, looking for an exit strategy, 
this kind of talk easily encourages the apathy and the ostensible justification of heading for the doors, the ostensible justification for a lack of action that is needed. That's my concern with how we talk about the end of AIDS. Of course, that would be a mistake if it were to be understood in that way, and if we were to allow decision makers to use it in that way and to justify further inaction. After all, thanks to researchers such as many of you in this room, we now know a great deal more today than we did 30 years ago about HIV, about how to prevent it, how to treat it, how to lessen the terrible toll of suffering and death. And indeed, if we were committed to bold evidence-based action, as we said we were in Leading Together, including on the global scale, then we would be scaling up condoms, male and female. We would be dramatically scaling up evidence-based safer sex sexual health education. We would be dramatically scaling up investment in finding things such as a microbicide and other new prevention technologies. We also know, of course, how to prevent transmission through sharing of drug use equipment. We know that access to methadone or other opioid substitution therapy is key. We know access to clean needles is key. We know access to ancillary services, such as supervised consumption sites, is key, and we know that these services are needed in prison. To save people's lives once infected with HIV, we know what works. We have dramatically improved HIV testing technology. We know that we need to scale up the human health resources to actually deliver good quality care, and we know we need pills into bodies. We also know, as has been demonstrated, quite dramatically through the deaths of millions and the saved lives of millions over the last 15 years, that scaling up access to medicine will absolutely require a central role for access to generic, affordable medicines across the, across the globe. That has been the single most important thing in actually saving millions of lives over the last 10 to 15 years. We also know what it would cost to do these things. Uh, and we have seen a record mobilization of resources to actually invest in the response. That said, we're far from where we need to be. But when you think about what's actually required to fully fund an effective global response to HIV, to actually achieve one day an end to AIDS, it's peanuts compared to what is spent on so many other things that are deemed more important, including the waging of war. We've seen a significant increase in the commitment by low and middle income countries themselves bearing the worst brunt of the epidemic to start investing from their own domestic budgets in the response, and that's important. And with these technologies and with the money in place, we now have scaled up in what I think must be a record short order, the number of people receiving life-saving medicines. This is a true public health victory for the ages, and yet we're still only about one-third of the way there. So it seems to me talk of the end of AIDS or the notion that we might be at some sort of tipping point is a little premature. And here are some numbers that illustrate how far we are, in fact, from that tipping point. Note the number of people still in need of access to treatment. Note who is still the most vulnerable and most affected by the HIV pandemic. And note the structural factors at play, and in particular, the first entry here in this infographic from UNA is that refers to the number of countries that have laws, regulations, or policies that block effective HIV services. This is surely an underreporting to only think that 60% of countries have these across all the key populations, uh, but it gives you a sense of what we still need to address. If we do not address those structural factors, we will simply never harness the benefit of all the technology that we have. And no matter how much money we may mobilize to actually deliver testing, to deliver treatment, to deliver prevention technologies, if people are afraid, if people are in jail, or if people are beat, beaten and abused, we will not achieve the end of AIDS. So in case you hadn't guessed it, I'm going to offer some opinions tonight, warning. And I want to turn to three case studies. The first is one that, for our organization, has been a constant preoccupation pretty much for the last 22 years of our existence. 
and one in which we've seen some very significant uh, evolution in the law and in the science that ought to, but too often doesn't, inform the law. So to give you the briefest uh, synopsis of where things stand now on this front, uh, perhaps many of you in the room will be familiar with the increasing number, some 155 plus at this point, to the best of our knowledge, of prosecutions against people living with HIV for alleged non-disclosure of HIV positive status. And I've put the three uh, requirements here, boiled them down from a lot of pages of legal writing, to, to the ones that are most significant. If someone does not disclose their known HIV status, and known is rather important here as a qualifier, and engages in activity that would pose a significant risk of serious bodily harm, that is transmission of the virus, to someone who would not have consented to that sexual encounter had they been aware of their partner's HIV positive status, then in law this is treated as a fraud and the person is guilty of an aggravated sexual assault because there is no legally valid consent to that sexual encounter. In essence, non-disclosure in the presence of a significant risk of serious bodily harm equals rape in law, with a maximum penalty of life in prison and a mandatory designation for life as a sex offender. Now that was some 16 years ago now that the Supreme Court of Canada first articulated that legal test. Most recently, after a number of lower court decisions over the years across the country that highlighted the uncertainty and the unfairness inherent in that rather vague test, the Supreme Court had another kick at the can. In two cases that were before it, you see the names of them here, one from Manitoba and one from Quebec. And it has, to use its words, clarified, and I put those words in quotes because I don't think it has clarified much, that when we talk of a significant risk of serious bodily harm, we refer, uh, the courts are referring to a realistic possibility of HIV transmission. That is the new test, that is the new key phrase. So for those of you who over the years got used to remembering the phrase significant risk as the key test that everybody needed to be thinking about, the new words are realistic possibility, which ostensibly in the court's view mean the same thing. I'm not sure that they do, but through a little bit of legal sleight of hand, this is now the test. Now, uh, as a result of what the court ruled in these two cases, people living with HIV in Canada now have a duty to disclose their HIV status to a sexual partner before having vaginal or anal sex, at least, if no condom is used. Their viral load is irrelevant. Or, if their viral load is something higher than low, then they must still disclose and the use of a condom is irrelevant. In our submission before the court, we had said that at the very least, either of these conditions being satisfied should preclude someone from being criminally prosecuted for non-disclosure. That either of them is sufficient to lower the risk of transmission enough that we should not be triggering the application of the criminal law, one of the most serious offenses in the criminal code. The court did not buy that argument, unfortunately and said, no, you need to wear a belt and suspenders. You must have both condom use and a low or undetectable viral load. This was in rather sharp contrast to the bulk of the cases before that point, which seemed to be accepting the notion that condom use, for example, would be sufficient. Now, this approach that the Supreme Court has now articulated and that courts below will now have to apply on the backs of people living with HIV uh, is contrary to international recommendations that have come out in recent years, including from the Global Commission on HIV and the Law, and also from UNAIDS itself. And it seems to me rather strange and poignant, as expressed in this quote from Louise Binder, uh, one of Canada's leading uh, activists living with HIV, that we've now reached this terribly ironic situation in which fighting for medication that actually gives people the ability to leave, lead, as what she puts here, is a reasonably normal quality of life, are now going to be in the position of being penalized for doing so, including being healthy, sexually active people. And indeed, the cases that we have seen uh, since those Supreme Court decisions give us cause for concern. 
We've seen a couple of appellate court decisions from Ontario, uh, one of which actually reaffirms this very notion that there is in fact no need to put medical evidence before the courts, that now that the Supreme Court has spoken and said, condoms alone will not suffice to relieve you of the duty to disclose, nor will viral load being low or undetectable relieve you from the duty to disclose. You must have both. That basically now courts will take what's called judicial notice of this. Now that's one approach. I'm glad to say that it's not the only approach to interpreting what the Supreme Court has said. But there's enough, there's enough that's problematic in what the Supreme Court has said that in fact we've seen a number of circumstances that I can only characterize as miscarriages of justice. I'm thinking of a case in Yellowknife not too long ago in which after two years in pretrial detention, a 27-year-old Aboriginal man who had a history of a very difficult childhood um, pled guilty to two counts of aggravated sexual assault for not disclosing his status to two female partners. He had one single act of vaginal intercourse with each of them. In the first case, a condom was used. In the second case, it was agreed that both parties were too drunk to actually remember whether a condom had been used. So in law, we need to treat that as if a condom were used because the prosecution has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that a condom was not used. For those two encounters in which nobody was actually infected with HIV, his partners were not infected, two acts of sex using a condom, he spent, after two years in pretrial detention, he spent a total of three years in prison and is now designated a sex offender for life. So someone who practiced safer sex had two encounters. That's what our criminal justice system is doing. I think of a case in Barrie, Ontario, last year as well, where police charged and then the Crown prosecuted vigorously a woman living with HIV who had an undetectable viral load for aggravated sexual assault on the allegation that she did not disclose her HIV positive status. Three charges related to three different instances. One of those charges involved her receiving oral sex for all of two minutes before police interrupted the scene. There is no realistic possibility of transmitting HIV in such a circumstance. And yet, she was charged with aggravated sexual assault for that encounter. I'm pleased to say that she was found not guilty on that particular charge, but nonetheless, she was sentenced at the end of the day for one act of vaginal sex without a condom to three years and three months in prison. And again, sex offender designation for life. There was no transmission of HIV. There was no realistic possibility of transmitting HIV. But don't lose hope just yet, because in fact there is still a role for science, even though those cases might suggest science has just gone out the window. And this is where it's really important for many of the people in this room to come in. And hope is actually coming from the East Coast, so way to go, Nova Scotia. And it's in the neighborhood, it's not Newfoundland, sorry. Just recently, a teenage boy in Nova Scotia who also had a very difficult life, who has an undetectable viral load, not because he's been on treatment, because as it turns out, he appears to be an elite controller who is naturally controlling the virus at a very low level, uh, had, was facing two charges in relation to two different complainants for one act of vaginal sex without a condom in each case. He had an undetectable viral load and fortunately, he also had a defense lawyer who got it, who understood the critical importance of actually trying to find what loophole there right, might remain in the law, notwithstanding the Supreme Court of Canada's decision. And I had the great pleasure of speaking with her last week at a fascinating conference we held in Toronto exploring feminist critiques of the criminalization of HIV. And what she equipped herself with, because she knew enough to do so, was good science, and she found an excellent medical expert who came and testified to the court in these words, I do not believe there was a risk of transmission in this case. The risk was infinitesimally small, one in a million, perhaps as high as one in 500,000, very close to zero. For all practical purposes, there was no risk. Because that lawyer got that evidence and that medical expert and put it in front of a judge, who was actually two judges, who were willing to take the time to consider carefully 
the deficiencies in the Supreme Court's approach, they came to the conclusions that indeed science still has a role to play here. That the Supreme Court could not possibly have meant that subsequent courts were to blind themselves to the science in the facts before them. That it could not possibly be the case that they wanted courts to just robotically apply this notion that you have to have both a low viral load and condom use before we're going to say the risk is low enough that we won't throw criminal penalties at you. And so in fact, they acquitted in those cases. Why? Because the science was there. Because a medical expert was there to say what the court needed to hear to resist uh, a fairly constrictive interpretation of the Supreme Court's approach. And that's why it's really uh, a great pleasure to have heard on the news this morning and to know that tomorrow at this conference, uh, more than 70 science scientists will be presenting a statement on criminal, on the risk of HIV transmission in the context of the criminal justice system, precisely because they are concerned that the criminal justice system in Canada has gone too far and that science really needs to be reinserted into the legal analysis. I can only hope that prosecutors and judges will in fact listen. Recall in fact that eight years, eight years, no, six years ago now, the uh, controversial Swiss statement was issued and it was issued about the risk of HIV transmission being so low in various circumstances precisely because scientists were concerned that public policy had uh, gone a little haywire and that the criminal justice system needed to be reined in. So in that area, we need scientists, and we need scientists who are willing to come forward and based on the science, take a very firm position about what the law should be and what it should not be. Let me turn to uh, another case study, specifically access to harm reduction services. It was 12 years ago now that we, jointly with Human Rights Watch, gave our first award for action on HIV AIDS and human rights to, to Vandu, the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users, a world leading organization in fighting for the rights of people who use drugs. And I was reminded recently by Joanne Chetta, my immediate pre predecessor at the Legal Network, and one of the smartest, most hardworking and principled human rights advocates I know, that at that award ceremony, Anne Livingston, one of the coordinators of Vandu, recalled a rather revealing incident of loss among the so many losses that in the late 1990s were ravaging the downtown east side. At that time, more than 400 people were dying each year, so that's more than one a day on average from AIDS or from overdose. And it was during this time that one night four, quote, respectable men with families who lived, quote, normal lives in the suburbs went out and scored what they thought was cocaine. It turned out to be heroin, cut with a toxic substance, and the four men all died following an overdose. In the media coverage that followed their deaths, one outlet highlighted the pain of this particular loss for the community by pointing out that these men were, quote, not just junkies. As long as that kind of attitude animates our thinking about the war on drugs and the people who use drugs, including on the part of our policymakers, we will never overcome the AIDS pandemic. And in fact, it was in the downtown east side that one of the hardest fought battles, which is now running for more than a decade, uh, in the war on drugs has been fought, and that is the struggle for access to supervised consumption services. Recall that the Canadian law on drugs prohibits the unauthorized possession of controlled substances, and this clearly engages their liberty. And when we actually pro prohibit them from possessing drugs at a premise such as Insight, the supervised injection site in Vancouver, it also, the courts have found, engages their right to life and their right to security of the person because it forces them to choose between their liberty and their health. Now, the minister has the power to exempt people and places from this criminal prohibition on the possession of drugs. And indeed, this is what was ultimately used in 2003 to give the first exemption to Insight in Vancouver. Ultimately, as many will know, in 2006, the government moved to or signaled that it would be discontinuing 
insights exemption. And therefore, human rights advocates and public health advocates went preemptively to court to try to prevent that from happening. And at the end of the day, the Supreme Court found that indeed, the Minister of Health had improperly and unconstitutionally denied the necessary exemption to insight, to permit it to operate without the fear of its clients or its staff being criminally prosecuted. And in particular, the court was scathing about how the minister's decision had been arbitrary, declaring that the goals of Canada's drug laws were public health and public safety. I wouldn't agree with that premise quite so easily, but that's what the court said the goals were. And the court said that to exempt insight from this criminal prohibition on possessing drugs and thereby to allow it to operate without the risk of its clients being prosecuted does not undermine the objectives of public health and safety, but furthers them. It was therefore arbitrary for the minister to have denied uh, an exemption to allow continued operation of insight. Very importantly, the court also went on to say that the minister's decision to deny an exemption to insight was grossly disproportionate in its effects. It declared that insight saves lives and its benefits have been proven. There has been no discernible negative impact on the public safety and health objectives of Canada during the eight years of operation at that time of insight. Whereas the potential denial of health services and the correlative increase in the risk of death and disease to injection drug users outweighs any benefit that might be derived from maintaining an absolute prohibition on possession of illegal drugs on Insight's premises. And what was absolutely key to securing that victory in the Insight case was the extensive, authoritative, carefully compiled, rigorous evidence about the harms at issue and the great success of this health service in reducing them at least to the extent that, of course, one single site with fixed capacity can possibly make a difference in rectifying a much larger problem. And because of this evidentiary record, the court was able to say not only should uh, the minister have granted an exemption to insight, but the court was able to go on and say that in future when the minister is considering an application to open other such sites, where there is this sort of evidence about the potential benefits of such a site, and there's little evidence or no evidence that it will have a negative impact on public safety, the minister should generally grant an exemption. Unfortunately, the government wasn't really so inclined to hear that message, and instead introduced what is now known as Bill C-2, which is still pending before Parliament labeled the Respect for Communities Act, although I think it's nothing but, and I actually prefer to characterize it as the Hurdles to Health Act. The very morning that the bill was introduced, the government actively fanned the flames of stigma against people who use drugs. The morning that the bill was introduced by the Minister of Health, ironic given that this is a bill that aims to actually block the operation of health services, this message went out across the country from the governing party, declaring that this bill was aimed at keeping heroin out of our backyards, that people ought to have a say to try to block such supervised drug consumption sites from opening, and a number of other statements here from the letter that accompanied it, uh, fear-mongering and basically suggesting that as I write this, special interests are trying to open up these supervised drug consumption sites in cities and towns across Canada over your objections. But it's not just the fight over supervised consumption services. In fact, Canada is at the moment taking its fight against harm reduction more broadly to the international stage, much to our shame and chagrin. I was recently in Vienna at the UN Commission on Narcotic Drugs the annual GABFest where member states of the UN get together every year to talk about just how fantastically the war on drugs is going, to congratulate themselves by reciting how many tons of this or that drug they seized and so on. Conveniently ignoring most of the time the fact that this doesn't seem to actually make any dent in consumption of drugs, traffic of drugs, and so on. And yet they keep on carrying on that you know this is what we need more of. But there was something different that was happening this year at the Commission on Narcotic Drugs. 
Uh, one thing that wasn't so good that was different was that Canada was now actively opposing references to harm reduction in the negotiated statement that was to come out of this particular session. Aligning itself with countries such as Russia, China, Pakistan, etc. Now, when we raise this with Canada's diplomats in Vienna, these concerns, our concerns about the reports that were being received about it, Canada didn't want to, to see references to harm reduction in the ministerial text that was to be adopted at the end of this session, they were quick to point out that, well, why are you only naming those countries? Why don't you say that we're uh, sharing this camp with countries like the US? And what I didn't say at the time, because the conversation moved on, but perhaps I should have, was that given that the US has been one of the leading proponents of the global war on drugs and has spent trillions of dollars in a hugely militarized operation around the world that has led to untold human suffering with no discernible effect on the use of drugs, I'm not sure that this is really such a great justification for your position. I wanted to say, and if Jimmy jumped off the bridge, would you too? Because that's the logic that you're using. Now, all of this discussion in Vienna um, ha showed two new things. Uh, well, I guess two things in addition to, to Canada's newly uh, obvious obstructionism when it comes to harm reduction. The first was a new feature of this kind of session, and that was uh, the conclusions of an eminent scientific expert group that presented their report to the member states in Vienna. This is not something that had previously been done, but indeed is a welcome innovation, because one of the things that will lead to an eventual change in global drug policy is indeed the evidence presented by researchers. And they concluded that countries that have implemented the harm reduction measures that are being recommended by UN agencies have, quote, remarkably reduced the number of HIV infections among people who inject drugs. And yet, notwithstanding this clear statement of the evidence and the direction in which it should point, all that member states could do in negotiating a text by consensus is, quote, encourage states to, quote, consider providing these measures. Obviously, that consensus is simply not enough for millions of people needlessly suffering the world over. But the other new thing that was more encouraging was that, in fact, this decades-old consensus about how we must continue carrying on, that we must maintain the war on drugs and pursue a more of the same steady-as-she-goes course, in fact, is increasingly under challenge, even from within, even from member states themselves. After all, in the last year, we've seen two U.S. states move to decriminalize and regulate cannabis, uh, as has Uruguay. We have seen a number of states this year in Vienna actually explicitly say, our current system is broken. In fact, as the head of Uruguay's delegation observed in his statement to the plenary, there is overwhelming evidence that drug current policies of drug prohibition have failed have produced a spiral of violence over the decades. And in fact, he went so far as to declare it his government's duty to recognize that failure and to act on that evidence by adopting new, less harmful approaches. Two years from now, the UN General Assembly will hold a high-level special session on global drug policy. And so our challenge, in my view, between now and then, is to actually increase the number of countries who are willing to say, the system is broken, the emperor has no clothes, we need a new approach, and the evidence points the way. I think it will happen, but it will only happen if scientists join forces with human rights advocates and make the case forcefully. If we don't bring forward the evidence, if we don't condemn the human rights abuses that are being committed in the name of war on drugs, then we will continue to sit by while we see imprisonment, torture, forced testing, violence, abuse, compulsory detention and drug treatment camps in various countries around the world. And we're already seeing the consequences in one of the world's most populous states with one of the world's fastest growing HIV epidemics linked to injection drug use, Russia, where needle and syringe programs exist in a legal gray zone and where methadone treatment is actually criminally prohibited. It's not surprising that millions of people are getting infected and millions of people are dying without adequate treatment and care. 
at the end of the day, it comes down to this. We're never going to end AIDS unless we address the structural problem that is the war on drugs. It's that simple. And of course, one of the tail ends of the criminal justice system, however you get there, whether it's because you're living with HIV and got convicted for not disclosing to a sexual partner, even though you used a condom or you had a low viral load, or because you got caught up in the dragnet that is the war on drugs, if you end up in prison, God help you. We know in Canada that we have a very significant problem with HIV and Hep C prevalence in prison, and it's researchers in this room who have generated that data that will eventually, I hope, convince our policymakers, and if not them, our courts, that we need to change current prison policy. We have HIV prevalence in Canadian prisons that is eight times higher, at least, that of the Canadian population as a whole, and hepatitis C prevalence that is at least 38 times higher than in the population as a whole. Uh, some 30%, almost one in three, and it's actually more than that for women, of prisoners in federal institutions are living with hep C. And you see here the prevalence for HIV as well. We also know from self-reported data by prisoners that in fact, prisons and people in prisons are at high risk. High levels of injecting outside of prison and certainly a high percentage of people having injected inside of prison. And simply self-reported numbers show high prevalence of HIV and hep C. So we know that we're incarcerating people who are at higher risk than the average Canadian of being HIV or hep C positive. We know that risk behavior, including injection and sharing of injection equipment is going on inside. And yet, we haven't introduced one of the key HIV and hep C prevention programs that we know from decades of experience work outside prisons. We also now, however, two decades, have over two decades of experience of these programs working inside prisons as well. In 60 prisons in more than 10 countries now, needle and syringe programs have been functioning with very, very positive results and with no, no concern about institutional safety and security. Notwithstanding this, our policymakers have refused so far to introduce needle and syringe programs in any Canadian prison, federal or provincial, even though they have been presented time and time again with the evidence, even though leading medical expert organizations such as the Ontario Medical Association and the Canadian Medical Association have recommended them, even though the review of evidence done for the Correctional Services of Canada by the Public Health Agency in 2006 found that the evidence supported moving forward with prison needle and syringe programs. So all of the evidence isn't sufficient. Hate to break it to you. So this is where we come in as lawyers because we've been pushing for a long time and trying to convince the policymakers that this was the right thing to do, but clearly the current government is not willing to do that and they've made no bones about that. So we have now gone to court and we hope that case will be proceeding over the course of the coming months in an effort to show that just as in the case of Insight, we cannot let criminal prohibitions on drugs and drug use go so far as to deny people access to evidence-based health services. That applied in the case of Insight and the criminal law had to give way. The same sort of logic should apply in the prison context. So uh, I want to leave you with just a few final thoughts about what this might mean going forward. Now, I hope that the case studies I've presented uh, adequately illustrate the hostility to science as well as to human rights that seems to be currently animating public policy in Canada. There are many other instances uh, in other areas to which I think we could all point, but those should be in and of themselves sufficient to give us some cause for concern. It's against this backdrop that we have begun to hear about the so-called integration agenda. And as the companion to that, the notion that somehow HIV exceptionalism, as it has been called, must give way. That the response to HIV must now be integrated with the response to other things. But I think the term HIV exceptionalism gets tossed around in a variety of ways. And as the term integration 
is being presented to some degree in contradistinction to exceptionalism, i.e. exceptionalism is bad, integration is good. I think we need to unpack a little bit what those terms mean. So what might HIV exceptionalism mean? On one level, it's been used to refer to the existence of separate strategies, funding streams, organizations, services, and programs that are focused primarily or exclusively on HIV and that may exist as entirely standalone initiatives or at least at some remove from other initiatives addressing other public health issues, such as other sexually transmitted infections, hepatitis C, and so on. So in this narrow sense, it could be said that integration is indeed the opposite to HIV exceptionalism in the sense of collapsing dedicated HIV funding into larger health funding envelopes, which is what the current federal government is proposing to do, uh, expecting organizations to address not just HIV, but also to take on attention to other related health concerns and so on. But I don't think that's really what we mean when we're talking about HIV exceptionalism. Having a national strategy or a provincial strategy focused on AIDS, or a government advisory committee, or a high-level council, or dedicated HIV funding, or AIDS service organizations isn't really all that unique or exceptional. Consider, after all, such things as national strategies with associated funding, research initiatives, community organizations, and so on, on other health concerns such as cancer, smoking, mental health, drug use, bullying, housing, unhealthy diets, lack of fitness, etc. It seems to me to make perfect sense that a response to a significant public health concern be organized by identifying it and then coming up with steps to tackle it, including ones that are specific to it. The concern ought to be, is the response informed by evidence, and does it consider the multiple facets that need to be addressed if we're to be successful? So the fact that there are HIV strategies and organizations and HIV-dedicated funding and so on can't really be considered, per se, some sort of objectionable HIV exceptionalism unless you also think that having a Canadian partnership against cancer or a national anti-drug strategy or a mental health commission of Canada and so on is also somehow singling out and, quote, favoring a particular disease or health concern for, quote, special treatment. But I think that's the narrow and not particularly interesting or really accurate understanding of HIV exceptionalism. I think it's incorrect because it's not only not all that exceptional, but it also misses the deeper, more fundamental significance of HIV exceptionalism as a real phenomenon, the value of which should be better appreciated and not forgotten amidst the clamor for integration. Rather, in a deeper sense, the term HIV exceptionalism means that HIV is exceptional as a public health challenge in ways that have warranted and produced, and in my view continue to warrant, and I hope will continue to produce, an exceptional response, in the sense of a response that deviates from a, quote, traditional public health approach in some fundamental and valuable ways. HIV is exceptional, exceptional, although not entirely unique, because it travels along, highlights, and is fueled by social fault lines and inequalities in ways or to a degree that is unusually pronounced. It's exceptional in that it has an overlay of moralism that is uncommon, and it is exceptional in that it has been and is marked by a degree of stigma and prejudice with all of the subsequent human rights violations that follow that is unusual. I think it's unusual rather than unique because you can observe some of these things about certain other diseases, especially those associated with sex or other disfavored or stigmatized behavior in other contexts. But even if you look at that subset of diseases, it seems to me that HIV has carried a particular stigma. And it is part of this, because HIV has highlighted such fault lines and human rights concerns in a way that few other communicable diseases have, that there has also been an activist response that's also been exceptional. exceptional. And that activist response has often been lauded as creating a paradigm shift in how the public health establishment and the political and research establishments respond to a communicable disease, as we heard at the beginning of the evening. For example, the insistence that people living with HIV in communities particularly affected needed to be active participants in the response rather than simply being the objects of it is a critical part of that paradigm shift of challenging business as usual and responding to a public health concern. But it's that activist response, that insistence on human rights, and how those norms must transform policy and practice that I think is the real heart, the real core of HIV exceptionalism 
It's the lesson that the HIV response and those of us involved in it have taught to the world and must not let the world forget. And the basic proposition is that in any effective response, human rights are critical at both the population, health level, and the individual level. Now, this is not to say in some simplistic way that public health and human rights can never be in tension, of course, because they sometimes can be. But at a broad level, for both principled and pragmatic reasons, efforts to protect and promote public health ought to be premised on protecting and promoting the human rights of individuals living with and communities particularly affected by HIV. Now, I realize this isn't any great new insight, and that indeed Jonathan Mann, in the very early days of the epidemic, was amongst those who were leading proponents of recognizing this link between HIV and human rights. But I think it's important that we not lose that in all of the discussion that will continue to happen in the years ahead about the so-called integration agenda. The case studies that I've discussed above indicate why human rights is so central to the HIV response and also suggest what a human rights-based approach might be. The demand for human rights that lies at the heart of HIV exceptionalism, namely to take human rights concerns into account in making policy and implementing programs, is relevant to policy in not just those particular areas that I've touched upon, but in a very wide range of other areas, from immigration law to housing policy to income security programs, to the rights of LGBT people, to intellectual property policy and international trade law, from privacy law, access to legal services, and so on. So it seems to me that it would be profoundly premature, especially in the current context, to eject HIV exceptionalism in the sense of that heightened commitment to protecting human rights in policies, programs, and practices. Rather than abandon the human rights gains that are embodied in HIV exceptionalism, we should be insisting instead that those gains be spread beyond the HIV response, that we share that lesson with the world. So to the extent that an agenda of integration is an effort to harmonize and coordinate research, policies, programs, and services, so as to achieve fewer new HIV infections and better care for people living with HIV, then indeed it should be welcomed. But to the extent that an agenda of integration is simply the latest cloak for an effort to roll back the human rights gains made by what is derided as HIV exceptionalism, then such an agenda should be resisted. When calls for integration emanate from the same government decision makers consciously engaged in efforts to erode and eliminate the welfare state, who actively refuse to base public policies relevant to the HIV response, such as drug policy, prison policy, and so on, on evidence and on human rights, it's right to be skeptical of what the real agenda is. When government claims on the one hand that the HIV response should be integrated with a response to other public health concerns, and yet the impact of the HIV, uh, yet the impact on the HIV epidemic and other public health concerns, is not factored into public policymaking in a whole host of other areas, such as excising harm reduction from a national anti-drug strategy, to just give one example. And in fact, the government is pursuing policy on various fronts that undermine HIV prevention and care, and hence public health more broadly, such as worsening income inequality, putting more people with addictions in prisons, denying adequate access to HIV prevention services in prisons, pursuing trade agreements that will further limit access to medicines by making them more costly for longer through stricter patent provisions, and so on, then the call for integration is rather lopsided, and it's deliberately hamstrung from the beginning. To my mind, it's suspect. So to conclude, and I do promise I'm concluding, I noted that in the letter of welcome to all of us here at this conference, the Minister of Health, the Federal Minister of Health, urged upon us the familiar refrain, together we will turn the tide and make the end of HIV a reality. So let us in turn invite the government to replace the politics of denial, cowardice, and discrimination with a politics of evidence, of human rights, of courageous leadership against stigma and discrimination, against criminalization and marginalization of those most at risk and most in need of care. This is, after all, what was promised in leading together. Let it not be that our policymakers could ever hold the view that it's just junkies who are dying, or that it's just sex workers as they come up with a new law uh, to replace what the Supreme Court has recently struck down because of its harm to sex workers. 
When we talk about ensuring access to medicine, let us not forget that the vast majority of people who need access to medicine are poor and live in the developing world. It's not acceptable for policymakers as they adopt ever more stringent and restrictive trade and intellectual property rules to say, even if only implicitly, it's just Africans. And it's not okay for African leaders to adopt the kind of horrific anti-LGBT legislation that we've witnessed in a number of countries with the notion that it's just queers. Let me conclude with remarks from a former Minister of Health. And for those of you who know me, you might be a bit surprised to hear me quoting him. Most of you in the room, or many of you at least, likely attended the 2006 International AIDS Conference in Toronto. And you heard these words from the then Minister of Health, Tony Clement. And I quote directly from the text of his remarks. Our strength, resilience, and courage are greater than this epidemic. We have learned what works and what must still be done. We continue to face major challenges which require all of us to respond in an unprecedented way. Prevention, care, treatment, and support are complementary to each other. So too should our efforts be. Why? Because we all know that AIDS is 100% preventable. Because scientific knowledge, tools to prevent infections, and the means to prolong life cannot be amassed alone. Because addressing human rights and the underlying factors that make people vulnerable cannot be done alone. Because the AIDS story is now 25 years old, as it was then, and is still far from over. And because the government of Canada, and I believe all Canadians, are committed to work with the rest of the world to make this the turning point in our fight against AIDS. He ended his address by urging those assembled to turn that commitment from words into action and to show that passionate individuals, dedicated organizations, and caring governments can be unified in our fight against HIV and AIDS. That is my wish and my inspiration. Me too. Yeah. Thank you very much, Richard. Your lecture was a very uh, poignant reminder that when it comes to human rights and social inequality, we've come a long way, but there's still so much work left to be done. I'm sure I speak on behalf of everyone in this room when I thank you for your efforts in advocacy and giving voice to those who are often unheard, and for your commitment to educating the ignorant. Thank you very much. Please accept on behalf of CAR the, uh, this plaque, recognizing you as the 2014 Mark Wayne Bird Lecturer. Congratulations, thank you. Now I would like to invite Bob Hogg back to the stage to introduce this year's Red Ribbon Award recipient. I now have the pleasure of introducing the 2004 CAR, 2014 CAR Red Ribbon Award winner, established in 2001. The Red Ribbon Award is presented annually by CAR for outstanding service to the cause of research in a way that has increased our understanding of treatment and prevention of HIV AIDS while enhancing the quality of life for those living with the disease. CAR is pleased to announce that this year's winner is Darian Taylor. Darian. Darian has worked tirelessly as an advocate for treatment research, patient education, peer support, and improvement of the quality of life of those living with HIV AIDS for over 20 years. She worked throughout that time at the local, regional, and national levels. Darian co-chaired the treatment act activist organization AIDS Action Now, co-founded Voices of Positive Women, the Ontario Organization for Women Living with HIV AIDS, and, one is, and, one, and was one of the editors of the Positive Women, Voices of Living with AIDS. She worked with the Ontario Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care and Federal Government's AIDS Community Action Program, and most recently she was the director of the program delivery at Katy. Darian has, was also a CAR Council member for several years, which is most important. 
While Darian has recently retired, she continues to be a positive voice in the HIV community while advocating for effective treatments. On behalf of CAR, we thank you for all your efforts and can think of no one more deserving of this honor. Thanks so much for this incredible honor. Um, I'd like to just uh, make a little amendment to um, Bob's comment that I've worked tirelessly. In fact, I think the fact that I'm retired shows that I was tired. <laughs> but um, it's wonderful to be back here um, in front of so many people that I know and that I respect and that I love. I'd like especially to thank Dr. Carol Strike who nominated me for the Red Ribbon Award, and to also thank the CAR Council, its committees and staff, and all of you here who throughout the years have supported me, worked with me, encouraged me. So when I discovered that I was going to receive this award this year, I immediately began to cross-examine myself about what I had really contributed to HIV research. It's just the way I am. So at first, I came up with a rather predictable list. Um, I think actually you've heard a lot of it in, my, um, in the introduction that uh, Bob gave me. And in this list, um, I included my early uh, work with AIDS Action Now to spur on HIV research, particularly towards effective treatments for HIV disease. As well, I thought about my activism around issues relating to women with HIV that I undertook through Voices of Positive Women and also through the Women's Committee at AIDS Action Now. And this work included the publication of an early uh, booklet for people with HIV entitled what, entitled what You Need to Know About Clinical Trials and published through AIDS Action Now and the Clinical Trials Network. I also thought about how I had participated as a community research in a, um, uh, a project called the Making Care Visible Project, which examined how the work of self-care that's undertaken by people living with HIV was often rendered invisible by the way that we tend to think about work as paid work. I also thought about how many, many years ago, in the late 1980s, I participated in an early clinical trial of the drug ribavirin. Didn't turn out to be effective. As well as the number of cohorts and databases for people living with HIV or for women living with HIV that I continue to participate in. And then most recently, and I think this is something that I'm very uh, proud of and, very, uh, and was very engaged in. I was involved in a great deal of knowledge translation work and exchange work while I was um, employed at Katie, and I was instrumental in creating a, the partnership that exists um, between uh, Katie and CAR for the Learning Institutes for Community Scholars at the annual conference. But with this list, I really didn't feel like I'd gotten to the crux of um, what um, had really uh, um, been my contribution, what had been really uh, tough and difficult about, uh, about my work in HIV research. And so I thought about this a little bit more, and I realized that the thing that is probably the most difficult about being a woman with HIV and someone who's involved as the subject of research is that you are continually finding out things about me that I would really prefer that you didn't know. I've sometimes described this 
as the feeling that, and I think other people who've been involved um, as the subjects of research would um, understand this feeling. It's a bit like you are the only person in the room who's naked. And it's very humbling and very exposing to sit amongst colleagues, to sit among people that you respect, and to hear what research is having to say about, let's say, for example, the risk of HIV transmission from menopausal, HIV-positive women with undetective, undetectable viral load to their partners, because this valuable knowledge, knowledge that I recognize is important, also, at the same time, calls me out and exposes me. You all know about the infectivity of my saliva, my vaginal secretions. You know all about the models of the number of sex acts it took me to become HIV positive. You know about the overgrowth of candida in my gut. You know about my hopes, my aspirations, as well as my regrets and my disappointments. And by being present here and out as an HIV positive woman, as an HIV positive woman, I understand that I acquiesce to your knowing this. And I understand that this knowledge is important in our fight against HIV. But it doesn't make me less vulnerable or more comfortable. So I think really that the most significant contribution that I've made in HIV research in the 25 years that I've been involved is that through my work over the years, I've always strived to add a bit of a counterweight to the inevitable power imbalance that is inherent in research by looking around me to create opportunities for people living with HIV and especially women with HIV to understand ourselves more about research more about the science of HIV, to be able to participate in this exposing environment with at least the little fig leaf that knowledge provides. So that when the community scholars and the people with, and people with HIV attend CAR, we're doing it in an engaged way, knowing something about current trends in HIV research and having had some say in the direction of that research. So in the next few days, I really encourage you to take a look at some of the innovative work that's being done by people with HIV or with people with HIV that's here on display at CAR. And I thank you so much for this award and for welcoming me and welcoming other PHAs to stand here in front of you naked and afraid, I truly hope that this has made your research more worthwhile. I think it has. Enjoy the conference. Thank you. Congratulations, uh, on or well-deserved recognition. Congratulations. Please accept the plaque and the gift. Congratulations, Darian. Before we conclude our opening ceremony, I would just ask for your indulgence for just a couple of minutes of your time so we can run through a few housekeeping issues. Um, first off, CAR is pleased to provide you again this year with a mobile app to help you in your conference planning. The app is available for a free download through the App Store, and we would encourage you to take advantage of that. As well, with regards to internet access throughout the, ho the hotel and the conference facility, internet access is available for free throughout the Delta, and there's no password required. In the convention center where the exhibits and the poster viewing areas are, it's also available, and the password that's required is just simply the word conference. Tomorrow evening at 6.30, we will invite you to, uh, to join us um, for the CAR AGM. 
And uh, we certainly encourage you to come out, have a drink, listen to hear all about the association's activities over the past year, and to hear what the plans are for the next year. On Saturday evening, we're pleased to invite you to our um, annual gala event, done Newfoundland style. So leave your little black dresses at home, come out dressed for a fun-filled evening, um, courtesy of a pub crawl through the famous George Street that Michael was telling you about earlier. A limited number of tickets are still available for this event, so if you don't have yours yet, you can visit the, um, the registration desk. I believe the tickets are $50 for conference delegates and $100 for guests. But get them soon, because there aren't too many left. Um, the poster viewing and exhibit area is going to take place in Marconi Hall, which if you haven't been over there yet, is located in the adjoining St. John's Convention Center. And we'll head over that way shortly for our opening reception. Please note that this year all of the posters um, will be up for the duration of the conference, so that will provide you with ample time to, um, to, to um, visit the exhibitors and, uh, and take advantage of speaking with the, um, the authors for the posters. The exhibit times are available in your conference program as well as on the slide here, and I would point out that the Friday and Saturday afternoons are going to be the times when the authors will be uh, present to discuss their posters with you. I'll also just point out that um, getting to the, uh, the St. John's Convention Center, you could go outside, but you probably may have noticed a small bit of construction that's happening as they're expanding the Convention Center. For, so for this reason, we don't recommend that you go the outdoor route, but instead take advantage of the pedways, and we'll show you um, those now as we head over there for the, um, for the reception. In closing, we certainly hope that um, you've enjoyed the opening ceremony this evening and we hope that we've kicked off this conference and that the weekend will be an informative, thought-provoking and inspiring start for you. Um, and that will help you renew your commitment to the fight to help those living with HIV and ending HIV infection in future. So this concludes our opening ceremony. I just want to say one last time, bienvenue tout le monde. Welcome everyone to the very far east. We hope you enjoy the weekend. So now I will invite you to join us for an opening reception in Marconi Hall. And uh, the map does outline the, um, the, the way to the, uh, to the co convention center. But for simplicities and perhaps a little bit of fun's sake, please feel free to join our piper over at the left.